Hello, welcome to Chapter 7, Physical and Cognitive Development, Development in Early Childhood. Today we're going to look at um, physical changes, cognitive changes, changes in language, and differences in intelligence in early childhood. And these are some of the objectives that we'll be covering. First of all, um, an average child adds about 2 to 3 inches and 6 pounds per year. Steady progress in major locomotor skills. See Table 7.1 in your book on page 152 for milestones in motor development from ages 2 to 6 years. Uh, manipulative skills start to improve. Fine motor uh, control used for letters and drawing will improve enough during ages 5 to 6 for school skills to be displayed. And that's also on Figure 7.1 on page 152. <clears throat> So there's a lot of changes that are happening. There's a nice little video that talks about uh, the growing child right here. Um, this little chart, 7.1, really breaks down the gross motor skills and the fine motor skills um, that happen from ages 18 months to 5 to 6 years. Uh, for those of your parents, you probably uh, notice uh, the, the, the immense changes that happen in these couple of years. Um, this shows uh, children's drawings. Um, early, early training can accelerate the rate at which a child can um, learn school-related fine motor skills. Older children also benefit more from training than younger children. Um, learning to write letters um, aids in letter understanding. So these are examples of drawings in each category of two object forms. Um, the initial stages in the rep representation of a cube in a cylinder. Um, genes provide the mechanism for lateral, lateral, lateralization, but experience uh, provides the pace. Lateralization is where the left and right halves of the brain's cerebral cortex uh, execute different functional specializations. Um, this contributes to important neurological milestones in early childhood. Um, so the lateralization of language functions to the left hemisphere um, that's tied to language productions. So if you look here, um, brain functions are lateralized as shown in this, this figure. Um, neurologists think that the basic outline of lateralization is genetically determined, whereas a specific timing of the lateralization of each function is determined by interaction of genes and experiences. Uh, myelinization is a protective, where protective fatty material that wraps around serve nerve cells in the peripheral and central nervous system. Um, reticular formation is the myelinization of, of uh, RF, important early childhood milestone. Um, it regulates attention and concentration. Where the hippocampus is a part of the brain, where the myelinization of the hippocampus is important in improvement of long-term memory, transfer of information, and to long-term memory. So most learning involves uh, the hippocampus. Um, right and left-handedness. Um, it's right or left, not right or wrong. Uh, handedness emerges, emerges between ages two and six years of age. Uh, although 83% of the people are right-handed, 14% are left-handed, 3% are what's called ambidextrous. Uh, it appears early in life, and the research says, suggests it's a genetic link that causes this. Um, there's a little section in your book that talks about um, the role of parents in helping kids uh, sleeping well. Uh, pediatricians recommend effective bedtime practices that help children and their often sleepy parents sleep better at night. Um, what they, what they uh, recommend is a structured, predictable daytime schedule, regular bedtime, that's 8 to 10 hours before waking, uh, discontinued daytime naps, establish a routine of settling activities, and provide a transitional object. Um, I've learned as a parent, um, if I can get my kids to get a good night's sleep, they're going to be so much more effective at school. Um, so if you're a Manny's parent, where the kid was uh, sneaking into their room um, and refusing to sleep in his own bed and, and tantruming, um, how would you, what would you do to prevent them from awakening at night and getting into your own bed? Uh, we had a child at this age um, who would walk into walk around the house and get into stuff while we were asleep. And we actually put up a baby gate <laughs> across um, the, um, her, 
her um, doorway so she could not um, walk around and roam around in the house. Um, how might you explain in ways uh, which variable and reinforcement contributes to the behavior of nighttime awakening? Um, the variable reinforcement in this story was where Manny would um, be allowed to sleep with his parents um, randomly, and it, so it was very strong reinforcement, and he would have low tantrums whenever he was not allowed to get his way. But the key is uh, consistency. Um, next is health um, and eating pattern patterns. Preschoolers often eat less than the, when they're babies. They're actually, um, they eat about as half as much as uh, what their parents do. Uh, they may not consume the majority of their daily calories at mealtime. Um, they may have food aversions at this time. Eating behaviors can uh, bring on a lot of family conflicts. Eat your vegetables. Next, uh, illness. Um, Four to six bouts of sickness yearly, uh, most often are colds and flus. So about four to six bouts of brief sickness are typical, um, and it causes a lot. It's a big source of family stress. Next, uh, accidents. The majority of accidents occur at home. Drowning is the most common for ages one to four years. Motor vehicle accidents are the most common for children's five year children five years and older. Um, so here, you know, it's important to, to keep the home um, child-proof. So what is child abuse? Child abuse is physical or psychological injury resulting from an adult's intentional exposure of child to potentially harmful stimuli, sexual acts, or neglect. So two-thirds of abuse results in physical um, injury. 25% involves sexual abuse. 5% involves neglect, which means uh, they're not getting their, their needs met food, shelter, clothing. Uh, there's a nice little video here that talks about uh, mandatory reporting for everyone who is um, who is involved in child care, teaching, social work, health care. <clears throat> uh, Two-thirds of abuse results in, oh, we talked about that, but um, the prevalence of uh, child abuse um, is responsible for about 10% of emergency room visits. Between one and five, the children suffer physical abuse. 2,000 infants and children die each year as a result of child abuse. Another thing is uh, episodes of abuse are typically precipitated by everyday interactions between parents and child, such as a child spilling milk. Um, the, the key here is uh, socio-cultural factors that personal or cultural values that regard physical abuse as moral acceptable. In other words, if you were physically abused as a child, you're more likely to abuse your own children uh, unless you really make a commitment to do something different. Uh, cultural traditions that view children as property, um, that's going to lead to uh, a view that will lead to more abuse. And communities that support abuse, these abuse, beliefs that abuse is okay. So episodes of abuse are typically precipitated by everyday interactions between parent and child. That is true or false? True. Just uh, everyday interactions could turn into an abusive situation. So usually uh, kids um, who have physical or mental disabilities or difficult temperaments or <laughs> their age may lead to um, abuse or have a higher risk for abuse. Uh, characteristics of the abuser would be uh, if they're depressed, lacking in parenting skills or knowledge, they have a history of abuse themselves, their house, if they're abusing drugs or alcohol, um, if they have live-in male partners, um, they tend to be the abuser. Um, live-in male partners whose children are not theirs are more likely to be abusive. Kid will say, you're not my dad. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, you know how that goes. Um, next, our risk factors are family stress, uh, poverty, unemployment, Interparental conflicts. The presence of these factors in combination increases likelihood of abuse. Uh, post traumatic stress disorder um, creates what's called delays in developmental domains. Children removed from the abusive situation typically appear to catch up within a year. So, recovery is related to the quality of the post abuse uh, environment. Next, uh, preventing abuse that begins with education. It's important to inform parents about the consequences of child abuse, parenting classes, identify families at risk, 
and protect children from further in injury. Next, um, children's play. Uh, changes in, in very obvious ways during the years from ages one to six. Following a sequence as closely matches Piaget's stages. There's a constructive play, um, then there's first pretend play, substitute pretend play, social dramatic play, and rule governed play. So which of the research methods discussed in chapter one is best suited to study age-related changes in children's uh, play activities? And I'd say it would be, um, I would probably say the research methods of uh, observation. Uh, many children have imaginary friends, a phenomena that child psychologists consider to be entirely normal. Which of these stages of play would you expect to, to first see children inventing imaginary playmates? Uh, going back to that stage, I'd probably say the substitute pretend play right here. Uh, notice uh, Piaget's pre-operational stage in the child. Um, they have what's called semiotic or symbolic functioning is acquired. Uh, there's increased proficiency of uh, symbol use, such as models, maps, graphic symbols. And this is where they start um, thinking and uh, communicating the difficulty in logical thinking. Uh, this is where they begin their pretend play. Centration is a tendency to think of the world one variable at a time. Um, for instance, uh, if you'd see uh, all moving objects, they would think as a, like an animal. So if a leaf is following them, they think the leaf was actually consciously following them. Um, the use of animism or belief that inanimate objects are actually alive. Next is uh, egocentrism. And this is a child's tendency to view things from his or her own perspective. Um, guided by object appearance, they may create uh, frustration in commun communication. Here's a little video that'll help you understand egocentrism. Um, this is where the child is guided by their own point of view. Um, notice in this chart, um, this is figure 7.3, page 160 in your book. The experimental situations shown here are similar to the one Piaget used to study egocentrism in children. The child is asked to pick out the picture that shows how the mountain looks to her, and then to pick out a picture that shows how the mountain looks to the doll. Um, and she'll just explain the same thing as what she sees, not what the doll would see from that perspective. Uh, next is conservation, and this is understand that change in appearance can occur without change in, equality, in quantity. Um, <clears throat> successful conservation is based on three characteristics of appearance only matter, transformation including identity, compensation, and reversibility. Unsuccessful conservation involves centration and irreversibility. And this usually occurs from ages four to five. And there's a nice little video that, sh that examples this. But the child again is guided by his or her point of view. Um, ask, how would you explain each task to someone who has never heard of Piaget? Um, Assessing a child's stage of uh, cognitive development involves the discovery of how he or she arrives at the answer, not evaluating the answers as right or wrong. Uh, studies also suggest that children regulate their emotions based on social expectations, a behavior not possible if children are completely egocentric. Uh, Flavel's um, Perspective taking ability levels. Level one is a child knows that other people experience things differently. It begins at a, at two to three years of age already. Level two is the child develops a series of complex rules to figure out precisely what other the other person sees or experiences. And that begins at four to five years of age. And so it's a theory of mind. Uh, there's understanding of thoughts, desires, and beliefs of others. And here, this chart shows the progression. And understanding the reciprocal nature of thought is needed to form reciprocal friendships and to develop social skills. So that's kind of an important part of um, development, especially social development. Theories of mind um, is what's called the false belief principle. Children see a problem from another's point of view and discern what information causes that person to believe something that isn't true. So an understanding of the, um, 
that other people think. Uh, they don't understand that their thinking can be about them. Uh, at five to seven, understanding is of the reciprocal nature of thought. Six and older, the realization and knowledge can be derived through inf inference. Next, um, this is correlated with um, performance on Piaget's tasks, pretend play, shared pretends, pretending with other children, um, discussion of emotion provoking events with parents, uh, language skills and working memory, and cross cultural influences. Um, <coughs> language skills such as knowledge of words like want, need, think, or remember are related to theory of mind. Children with disabilities or congenital deafness or mental retardation develop a theory of mind much more slowly. Some research suggests cross-cultural influences um, because as, a, as they go into more industrialized nations, there tends to be a, a faster development theory of mind. There's a nice little video if you want to see that on the PowerPoint. Next is uh, um, neo Piagean theories in the case of Robbie. Um, operational efficiency is where the seven-year-old is better able to handle the processing demands of conservation tasks than is a four-year-old because improvements in operational efficiency. Uh, there's some called short-term space or STSS that refers to the child's working memory. Operational efficiency is a limited number of schemes to which a child can attend uh, improves through practice and brain maturate, maturation. And then the uh, matrix classification task requires a child to place a given stimulus in two categories simultaneously. Let's take a look at this task. So neo Piagians have used Piaget's matrix classification task in strategy training studies with young children. Before training, most preschoolers say that a a blue triangle or a red circle belongs in a box with the question marks. However, after learning a two-step strategy in which they are taught to classify each object first by shape, then by color, children learn to understand that a red triangle is a figure that is needed to complete the matrix. So, um, it just although it may not come naturally, it's something that can be trained and learned. Next is uh, information processing theories. One is called uh, meta memory, and this is knowledge about and control of memory processes. Two to six year olds have poor strategies for memory. Metacognition is knowledge about and control of the thought processes. Uh, this enables a child to generate strategies to solve problems. Now, both meta memory and metacognition improve during childhood. Scripts are especially useful for managing the demands of steps of tasks with sequential steps. Now, um, there's what's called uh, Vygotsky's social cultural theory. Uh, remember from chapter two that Vygotsky emphasizes social interactions as mechanisms for cognitive development and emphasis on the role of social factors in cognitive development. Uh, problem solutions are generally generated and learned. Key principles is what's called the zone of proximal development or ZPD. And scaffolding, and uh, um, and so the primitive stage is where the infant possesses mental processes similar to the animals. They learn primarily through conditioning. The naive psychology stage is where the child learns to use language to communicate, but does not does not always quite understand symbols. Private speech stage is where the child uses language as a guide to solve problems. There's an internalized by ages. This is internalized by the age of six to seven. And then in growth stages where you have logical thinking resulting from the internalization of speech acquired from children and adults in a social world. So um, what are Vygotsky's stages related to the eventual development of adult thinking? Each stage represents a step towards the child's internalization of ways of thinking used by the adults around him or her. Next is uh, fast mapping, and this is the ability to categorically link new words to real-world reference. Um, this occurs at about age three. Now, a tip to give an idea about this is a typical 2.5-year-old has a 600-word vocabulary. A five- to six-year-old vocabulary is as large as 15,000 words. Here she adds about two new words every day.
Fast mapping begins as early as age three as children begin to think of groups and objects in a single class. So the word learning drives the process of the language, of, of the language development. Next, uh, there's what's called a grammar explosion. It's a period in which the gra grammatical features of child speech become more adult-like. Um, this is where they um, learn inflections or additions that change meaning. The earliest inflection in English is the uh, addition of ing, like where going. Um, questions and negatives, that use, um, that's the use of particular sets of rules. Overregulation is using rules when they don't apply. Complex sentences, this is using con conjunctions that combine two ideas or using embedded clauses. Now this is strongly linked to vocabulary development. Um, so inflections could be like adding the S to cap to change the meaning. Um, questions, um, learning to add who, what, where, when, and why to questions. Um, negatives would be uh, putting not, NT, or no, but omit the auxiliary verb, for example, I not crying. Next is uh, phono phon phonological awareness. And this is where the, the child's sensitivity to sound patterns are specific to a language. This can be learned in school through formal instruction. Um, the greater a child's phonological awareness, the faster he or she learns to read. This primarily develops through the word, word play like nursery rhymes, games involving repetitive words, or invented spelling or attempting to write. <clears throat> For instance, this figure here on page 168 in your book is, uh, if you translate it, it's a snake came to visit our class. A five-year-old used a strategy called invented spelling to write the sentence about a snake's visit, accompanied by an animal handler, we hope, um, to her kindergarten class. Um, invented spelling requires a high level of phono phonological awareness. Research suggests that children who have well-developed phonological awareness skills by the time they reach kindergarten learn to read a lot more quickly. Now, um, Alfred Binet and um, Louis Turner and Simon um, measured vocabulary, comprehension of facts and relationships, and mathematical and verbal reasoning. Alfred Binet learned to identify children who might have difficulty in school. Uh, Louis Terman came up with the term um, intelligence quotient, which is your mental age over your chronological age times 100. Two-thirds of children exhibit an IQ between 85 and 115. Here's a nice little video about intelligence. There's also what's called the Wessler Intelligence Scales for children, and this is where you have verbal scales, performance scales, and working memory scales to determine a child's level of functioning in intelligence. Um, this figure, 7.7, .7, page 170 of your book, IQ scores form what mathematicians call the normal distribution or the famous bell curve. You may have heard about that. Um, the two sides of the normal distribution curve are mirror images of each other and, um, and 115. Uh, likewise, 13% score between 70 and 85, and another 13% between 115 and 130. So a few other uh, human characteristics, such as height, are normally distrib distributed as well. So can you explain what this bell curve tells us about IQ? Now, what I usually tell students is, is um, if you're between this range and this range, um, that's, that's the average range. Okay, correlations show a strong relationship between IQ and so school performance. High intelligence, regardless of class, is associated with resiliency and ability to develop the kind of self-confidence and personal competence to overcome obstacles. Lower IQ is associated with delinquency and adolescence, uh, adult literacy and criminal behavior. Um, however, um, there's consistent relationship are found within social classes and racial groups. Um, IQ scores are quite stable but do not measure underlying competence. Um, the problem with this is um, we're going to talk about the nature versus nurture debate. Uh, a lot of people say IQ is uh, inherited. Um, probably, you know, maybe about 40% could be um, genetic. However, there's a, the, 
the parents that pass on your genes also pass on your environment. Um, and there's definitely a strong connection between parent education and um, IQ of their children. So there's a high level of predictability. Masks an interesting thing, fact about children being tested. Do you know what that is? And here's a pretty interesting thing. Uh, Robert Guthrie talks about demographics and intelligence testing. And um, many children show quite a wide fluctuation in their scores. And it's not necessarily a predictability of success. Some other things they really should talk about is uh, um, motivation. Uh, another thing they should probably consider is um, their um, belief in themselves, um, in their resilience. Those are all things that can also, also um, positive people in their life that encourage them to do the best they can. <clears throat> okay, let's take a look at the uh, um, family influences. Uh, adoption studies also provide support for environmental influences of nurture over nature. Uh, children adopted in higher social class homes had higher IQ scores. Parents of higher social class provide interesting complex learning environments where there's age appropriate play materials, warm and appropriate response to behavior, descriptive, descriptively rich language environments, quick in answering questions, talk to children often, they avoid being excessively restrictive, punitive, or controlling. There's that appreciation and encouragement for school achievement. So those are definitely some um, things that can make a difference in a, a child's development. Next is when an enrichment program is begun in infancy rather than at age three or four, IQ scores remain elevated into adulthood. Head Start uh, aids poor children and supports intellectual development. They uh, try to provide kind of a, a similar experience that may happen to kids who are in some advanced daycares. Uh, they provide intellectual stimulation. They help children acquire new vocabulary. Children, children um, show a gain of about 10 IQ points through programs like Head Start. Uh, Long-term impact on children, children are less likely to be placed in special education or to repeat a grade because of how Head Start. Um, when enrich, um, let's see, next one is studies around the world consistently yield estimates that roughly 40% of the variation in IQ within a given population is due to heredity. The remaining variation is clearly due to environment or to interactions between the environment. So there, basically the consensus is 40% is um, genetic and then 60% is, is nurturing environment. Um, this figure here, page 173 of your book, in Ramey's studies, children from poverty level families were randomly assigned in infancy to an experimental group that received special daycare or to a control group with the intervention lasting until age five. At kindergarten, both groups entered public school. The difference in IQ between the experimental and control groups remained statistically significant, even seven years after the intervention had ended, when the children, uh, when the ch children were age 12. And that sources are uh, Ramey and Campbell, 1987. Um, Chinese and Japanese children demonstrate higher performance on achievement tests. Uh, African American children consistently score lower than well, white children. The differences appear to be narrowing and, and fall within um, the reaction range of scores possible with different environments. They also may reflect poverty differences. Uh, mixed race adoption studies support environmental influence. Um, there's what's called the Flynn effect. Over the last two centuries, IQ scores have increased in all groups. This is evidence of the strength of environmental effects. So people are not getting smarter. It's because when the environment improves, when health improves, um, nutrition improves, um, when um, tactics and, and teaching improves, um, the IQ improves. And then um, group differences in IQ or achievement test performance may be explained by the concept of reaction range attributed to cultural beliefs. Um, same amount of variation in IQ scores in all groups. Um, there was a, a book called The Bell Curve, um, which basically picked on um, certain races, saying that some 
because these people uh, had lower um, IQ, it was because of their genetic, um, it was poor genetics. Uh, when in reality, if you look at the data, um, it's the environment that, that fosters uh, IQ. Um, sure, they can account for maybe 40%, but um, an environment, if you put somebody in an environment where they're allowed to thrive, their IQ will, will, will be strong as well. So to test or not to test, um, first of all, IQ tests are useful for identification of children who have special needs, um, for also development of individual education plans for children with disabilities. However, labeling young children on a basis IQ could be, should be avoided. So you decide for yourself, which of these two statements do you agree with? School children should not be given IQ tests unless there's some reason to suspect they have a disability. Or using IQ tests to screen all school children for potential learning problems is good practice. And uh, this is the end of the slideshow. Thank you for your time.